And that story of the science of beauty everywhere, that the hermetic science, the alchemical science, was the science that said that when we see life, we realize that everything that is, is sacred. There is no hierarchy. Everything is the interconnection of intelligences. And I loved William Blake. Uh, he's, he's a godfather, really. Um, but he, he, and he's wonderful. I really feel like, especially for young creative people, they should have their William Blake book because he's a great mentor. He's the one who says the, the tigers of wrath are, are greater than the horses of instruction. You know, you start to say, yes, there's vitality. It's not all, yes, I'll be a good robot. And he said, I must create a system of my own or be enslaved by another man's. And if we had time to talk amongst ourselves, I bet you most of us would have this sensibility. We're drawn together because actually we're not looking to believe in another system. We're looking to believe ultimately in the systems that we bring forth as having some relevance and value. And that's why where Rilke says, I want to be with those who know secret things or else alone like the hermit, he also says, and I think this is very important for 12, 12, 12, this is the time for what can be said. Here is its country speak and testify. The things we can live with are falling away more than ever, replaced by an act without symbol. And that's why when this happens, it's incumbent upon us, and this is, you can look at history, there's always, in a way, almost like, like a, an immune reaction. When one thing happens, there's a type of immune reaction that starts to say, maybe the key now for all of us with 12, 12, 12 and these days is to declare, what is it that I need to say? If now is the time, if here is the place, if I am the source, what is it I am telling creation about the nature of who and what I am? And let me, in terms of theater, show up to the theater of this conversation and be worthy of the greater story. Not how does this reflect on my ego, but really how does this bring out my greater humanity. And these, I'm gonna go through some of the, the images because reunion is what I wanted to talk a bit about as well. We'll see an overlay of these relationships. Everything in this work, in this science here, is bringing up the truth that the life principle and the math principle these two qualities of form, structure, math, and the knowledge of life, energy, and artistry are coming back together. If you think of the two hemispheres of the brain, this will help us in terms of understanding why. Why is it so difficult to be human? The two hemispheres are, and you think about the mother and the father. The knowledge of the father, and we've been living in the time of the father, so what is that? I think. Therefore, I am. And if I think, then I think I'm not you. But when I understand the knowledge of the mother, which is I love, therefore I am, I say I'm born of both. I'm born of I love, therefore I am. And when I love, I realize we are one. When I think, therefore I am, I think I'm not you. And we're different. So isn't the crucible of the human heart how do we balance unique identity and the knowledge of shared reality? And that's what 12, 12, 12, I believe, is also beginning to ask. It says, like this, it's a seed, it's life. Life is not something that you grow. It's not something that you have an immediacy. You attend, and it grows. And when we understand, and this is a very important symbol. You'll see this at the base of the stairs underneath the watcher. And we will see how you have, in the tarot, there's called, it's called the mystery of the book of tea. And why this becomes important is this symbol helps us to understand what this mystery is. That when you count these up, you'll realize that there are 21 different compartments, this being five, the cross in here. Why this is important is you'll see how the tarot, the 21 numbered arcana, are in this. And a bit like the vision where we see the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life, it's trying to show us in terms of a shape that you see the cross of matter, but you see how the square here is also woven? So you have it like a, like, a, like a weave. It's going in and out of the square. The story is that we have been weaving in the cross of matter the qualities now that can hold the wheel that we see as the arcana, meaning the structure. So finally, the life and the structure can come together. And this is where then we enter into uh, our ancient depths, 
and we will start to see this journey. Because one of the things that interested me when I was writing about this tonight, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm so interested in having studied so many different traditions. And the one thing that's very helpful in terms of like what I've learned, and I think it might help you as well, is that, that when we begin to understand that all of the ancient traditions were not saying, guess what, you're not this. All of the ancient traditions were saying, guess what, you are this. Your ego thinks you're not this. Your ego looks in the mirror and thinks you're not there yet. You're not there. So this was one of the reasons why we would go through initiatory process, because it was to wean that ego that is always showing up in a sense like a hurt child, what's wrong with me, to finally say, no, I am much more the actor showing up to a role that I will allow to mediate itself through me. And really, it's a question of embodiment. And that's why, as we see the wheel, and this will also relate to the movement of the Maya when they talk about, and the Hopi as well, the four worlds or the four quadrants. Because in this story, it is that we have been journeying through the first world, the second world, the third world, the fourth world. And each of these worlds, as we can see, holds a unique archetype a unique gate. I liken this a lot to like a piano where you see the piano with the different keys. If you think of the human psyche as a piano, as a, as a type of instrument, then you would say, yes, well, we would have to evolve through different histories, different religions, because when we think about our human identity now, consider, I mean, we don't have a difficulty saying, yes, I am an ancient Egyptian, I'm a Hittite, I'm a Sumerian. We see a sense of our humanity as having come from being the outcome of this great wheel. And this is why we will see this spiral, that we've been journeying in this ratio. We've been journeying through these times to finally, as the Hopi say, uh, and as the Maya, we have finished with the fourth world. And when I showed you upstairs, you see the mirror of self-reflection up there? There's no further to go in self-reflection. And in that, then, we finally, this is what I'll show even with the thing, we stand in the center. This becomes horizontal, and we become that which has grown out of this story. And this is what we will see also in terms of the blossoming of creation. And in the next, we will see this story that these systems of the tarot and of the mandala start to show us in literal form here. And this is what I find so fascinating, is because art makes manifest. It's not simply theoretical. It's not believe this, if you will. It literally is in front of us. This is why the Renaissance model was that if your ideas are what you say they are, they will be beautiful. And they will create art because art is worthy of generation and transcends time. So it's not simply fashionable. Do you see? And that's a very important thing because this is getting at the deeper story that the human species is an artist of consciousness. And that the reason we go through all of these periods, why we've been on this cross, is so finally the wheel of structure, the keys, the instrument, the psyche, can hold the nature of its blossom. And if you think of the two, this is the knowledge of I think. I think this note is not this note, is not this note. But I realize it's an instrument. But when I love, what do I understand? It's about color. It's about awakening. It's about unfolding. And so we have the blossom and the structure, love and thought, shown in art. This is, of course, the watcher that we meet that's eight foot tall at the top of the stairs before we enter into the hieroglyph of the human soul. And I'll come back to this. But what I wanted to introduce tonight was this story that this, this image of Tor with the elongated head is very important because when I started working on her, and you'll see my Codex Tor books a little later on here, this is a very interesting proposition because I found as an actor, you know, you really can't figure out how to play a role. You can't, you know, you can't go to an expert. You can't go to, you know, God. I mean, pray sometimes when you, your play's dying. Please, <laughs> just don't have them have tomatoes. Um, um, but this, the, the story being that, that you learn to allow the, the, the informing, uh, for instance, to move through you. And as I was working on her, she started to tell me a remarkable story for our time. And this is why when I'm upstairs, I, I often say we don't come from not knowing, we come from vast knowing. And that the story is that it goes back 18 million years. 
and that we didn't come from not knowing, as I said, but we once had very large heads that had the capacity, like a supercomputer, to remember and interface with all knowing. But the question was essentially, what if we could forget what we know? And if you think from the artist's proposition, what's the most difficult thing? Memory. I am bound by what I think I'm supposed to have done, what I think I'm supposed So the question was, and think of, uh, of being an all-knowing being. The problem with being all-knowing is that unless you can convince yourself that you don't remember, you're not going to be very creative. You're going to be very elegant. You're going to be very interconnected, very, uh, in a sense, crystalline. But you're not going to be able to actually introduce chaos. What if I don't know? And this is what we're coming to terms with now. The great ingredient of life is spontaneous creation, meaning stepping into that which we cannot know any more than we can know when we step into the ocean off of a boat. Suddenly there are currents there, and what this is getting at is it's saying now we're at a point where we're being given tools to navigate. And this is why it's so important in terms of the stories we tell, because the story we tell ourselves inwardly is now opening up, essentially, you'd say, files within us that goes, oh, I'm glad you asked, because unless you ask, I can't open. But now that you've asked, we can take this story. And that's why this story of Tor is that we're finally coming into alignment with this opening of the mind of an ancient god. And this was a painting that you'll see at the top of the stairs as well which was looking back into many of the, the I, I was taken back to uh, three different stages of Atlantis o uh, over three nights, a bit like a Dickens thing, you know. Um, uh, uh, and, and each had a, a different disposition. Uh, we were talking about Gaudi because Carla and I just went to Barcelona and of course we got the Gaudi buildings. And, and uh, you see the cathedral there and it was very much like uh, from the Atlantean time where we did not think in terms of right angles. We have a hard time thinking about this, but the ancient art forms was not to show our hand like the Greeks with the right angle, man was here, but was to work so closely with nature that it became a great curiosity. Was this nature unaided, or was this the poetic relationship between the, the artist and nature? Do you see, so, so it's creating a sense of mystery and a sense of being drawn toward. And that's why a lot of this, I'm not going to go into the de details, but a lot of this is really looking at these greater senses.